I'm Howard Fields. I'm a professor of neurology. I, am, I have a long-standing interest in chronic pain and in drug addiction. Today I'm going to talk about the placebo effect. This is something that either explicitly or implicitly is going to play a very important part in how you relate to your patients and how effective you are as a clinician. In this lecture, I'm going to go through a series of issues. First, a definition of the placebo. In fact, what is it? You'd be surprised at how many people have an erroneous idea of exactly what the placebo is. Then, as a follow-up to that, how it is that you actually study the placebo effect. I'm going to get into how effective it is in different clinical problems. Then I will get to some of the nitty-gritty about the neural mechanisms that are necessary for the placebo effect to occur. I'm going to talk about the ethical implications of the placebo and what the practical implications are for how you deal with patients. So let's start with a definition. What is the placebo response? Very simply, a placebo response is an improvement in a, in a condition that's attributable to the expectation of benefit. And in general, it means that the actual physical properties of the treatment would not be expected to have any direct effect on the disease process. This is really an expectation or a psychological effect. That's the most important thing to remember about it. I think it's interesting in medicine to go back and ask what this is and what its implications are in the history of our profession. For healers have been around since prehistory, thousands of years. And this was even before there was any scientific basis for the, the practice of medicine. There were people who engaged in a practice and people got better. I'd like to go over a couple of those things to give you a flavor for what this was like historically. It's a wood cutting by the a famous artist Honoré Daumier in the early 19th century. The early 19th century in France was a time of great scientific progress. The field of chemistry was actually developed in France around this time. People knew that you could kill people with poisons. This is been something that was done traditionally for hundreds of years. They also knew that the more dilute you made the poison, the less effective it was. And if you diluted it enough, a person would survive attempted poisoning. This was the rationale for the use of hydrotherapy, which is illustrated in this slide. You can see that they are pouring water down the patient's throat and they are soaking the patient's feet in a pail of water. The idea was to dilute the toxins out. A variation on this theme exists to this day. It's called chelation therapy, and you can still get it if you want it. Very early on in the history of medicine, people began to realize that some of the treatments that were being provided by the average practitioner were bogus. Uh, the following is a quote from a famous uh, physician, Burton, in his, his very famous classical work, Anatomy of Melancholy. This was published in the 17th century. And the quote is, an empiric oftentimes or a silly surgeon makes more strange cures than a rational physician because the patient puts more confidence in him. This illustrates an example of that. It's a, it's a wood cutting entitled Dr. Wormbrandt Curing Insanity around the same time that uh, Burton wrote this quote. Here the belief was that psychiatric illness was due to possession by demons and so they used various techniques to rid the body or the brain of these demons. This is a nice example of a 16th century CT scanner. Patient's head 
is placed in the scanner and by baking, visualization of these demons could be produced. So these are the various demons that are being uh, expurgated. One in particular that was probably the offending pathogen. Another approach to the same problem is illustrated over here where a purgative was given and the demons were rectally excreted. So these were two bogus treatments subsequently shown not to be effective. So how is it that despite the fact that 99% of the treatments that physicians were providing for their patients uh, were ineffective, why did people come back? Why were they willing to spend good money and why were physicians held in such high social regard by society? There must have been some reason. In fact, many people who were given these treatments did improve. However, in addition to the treatment being effective, there are three other reasons for improvement following a treatment that have nothing to do with the effectiveness of the treatment for the disease being treated. One is natural history. We'll talk about that. Some, people, some diseases just improve spontaneously. For example, I'm sure all of you have suffered from a cold or the flu, came out of nowhere. There's really nothing you can do to treat it, and yet it goes away. So there was a very serious illness, or it felt like a serious illness, and it got better on its own. That's called the natural history. That improvement due to the natural healing properties of the body or a time-limited effect of the pathogen. Another issue that needs to be dealt with, which I'll talk about, is regression to the mean. And finally, beyond these two processes, there is the placebo response. And I, I feel that unless you understand natural history and regression to the mean, you really don't understand what the placebo response is. So let's talk about them in turn. Let's talk about first natural history. Let's say that what we're talking about here is a headache. I'm sure everybody who's listening to this video has experienced a headache. 99 times out of 100, the headache goes away on its own or you take an aspirin, it goes away, comes on out of nowhere, maybe in another week or three weeks, you get another headache, it goes away. So the natural history of a headache is to go from no pain, which would be down here, to its peak severity up here, and then to improve down to almost completely normal. So that would be the natural history of a headache. Now let's say, for example, you have the same time course and at this point, down below, you actually give a sugar pill. Let's call it a, something that has no active ingredient in it. You can see that the time course of this headache is unchanged. The person who had the headache improved. They improved following receiving this sugar pill, but it was, the sugar pill was not the cause of the improvement. That's essentially natural history. Another thing that's very important about this is that a lot of people would say that because there was improvement in the condition, in this case the headache, it must have been the sugar pill that cured it. That's what I call the false attribution of causality. You're making an assumption that it was the treatment that caused the improvement. And as we can see from this example, that wasn't the case. Now this is even... Uh, can be shown even more clearly by the following example. I call this the Groundhog Day experiment. Um, many of you have probably seen the movie Groundhog Day where the person just keeps living the same day over and over again with slight changes. So let's assume that we could live the same day identical for everything except this one manipulation. So here's our pain level over here. Let's just say that we begin the treatment at some point during a headache. Let's call that here. Well, the natural 
history is down here at the dark line, okay? You've given the treatment, you're reliving the same mechanism, the same day, and what you see is that the time course is to improvement, but the improvement's not as good as when there was no treatment. So here's an example of a treatment that actually made the condition worse, but the person still felt that that treatment made them better. Again, the false attribution of causality. The converse example is illustrated below, same scale, okay? The dark line is with no treatment. They're gonna repeat the same day, and the dotted line is what happened following a treatment that was given at this point here, okay? And what you can see is this line shows less pain than with the no treatment group. So in this case, there was an improvement due to the treatment. However, the pain got worse. So a person's quite likely to come in and tell you, you know, doc, that treatment made my pain worse. That's not the case. I'm not saying that you should argue with the patient about whether or not it was the treatment that worsened the pain, but you should know that it's possible that the treatment you're giving is effective even though the pain in this particular instance got worse. So that's natural history, and I think we have that pretty well in hand. So let's go on to regression to the mean. And again, let's focus on headache because it's, some, it's a condition that all of us, almost all of us have experienced, and we know that it comes and goes, and we know that headaches have different severities. Sometimes it's a very mild, barely noticeable headache. For example, if this is headache pain severity over here, okay, and these are successive headaches over time, this might be an average headache here. Uh, here's a, a very minimal headache. Here's a very bad headache, you can see, very bad. So what we're showing here is that maybe over, over the course of a couple years, you may have 100 headaches. The average headache severity will be the most common, and then very mild headaches are less appreciated. Very severe headaches are less likely to happen. So if we accept that, how do we define regression to the mean? Well, regression to the mean simply means that if you have a threshold, let's call that here, I'm gonna call it TMD. This is the threshold headache severity that would be required to go to a physician. So my guess is that most of the people who experience headaches either get an aspirin or tough it out, they rarely go to a physician for a headache. So there has to be a given level of severity that's so bad that you have to seek medical help. And by and large, when people come to a physician complaining of a headache, it's gonna be a serious, severe headache because it's just so much trouble to go to an MD. So let's say that it's, this is the headache that exceeds the threshold severity required to get you to go to a physician. All right, so now you're gonna go, you're gonna be, your headache severity is gonna be somewhere way up here. And you can see that no matter what the physician does for your headache, the next headache, the probability is that the next headache is gonna be somewhere closer to the mean. So that's what regression to the mean is. And in general, it's important because patients seek medical attention when their symptoms are severe. And so whatever treatments are applied, if it's a recurrent problem of varying severity, the severity will be less following the initiation of treatment with seeing the physician. So that's regression to the mean. Given that the natural history is always gonna be there and regression to the mean is a significant issue, how do you actually determine whether or not a placebo effect has occurred? Well, the number one thing to remember is in order to demonstrate that a placebo effect has occurred, you have to have a no treatment control. In general, this means that any given single instance of a placebo effect is not something you're gonna be able to see. You need to 
actually treat groups of people with either placebo or no treatment to see what the placebo effect is, if it's there at all. So here, this slide illustrates that. Let's just say that A is natural history. So that's a group of subjects that didn't get any treatment. B, a treatment was applied at the vertical arrow, and you can see that this group had a faster reduction in their pain severity. So this dotted line is the placebo effect. The placebo effect is the difference between A and B. In general, when people are doing clinical trials to establish that a medication is effective for a condition, they usually like to have a placebo control. Placebo control will cover everything, natural history, regression to the mean, bunch of nonspecific effects, but then the treatment would see, in this case, let's call that active drug, and the difference between placebo and active drug, the difference between B and C, is the general average effectiveness of the drug for that condition. So A minus B is placebo effect, B minus C is active drug effect. So now we've just described what the placebo response is and what the placebo effect is. We've differentiated it from natural history and regression to the mean, and now we understand why it's so important to use a placebo control group when trying to establish the effectiveness of a new treatment. Now that we understand what the placebo response is, let's get into the psychological and neural mechanisms that underlie it.